All right. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, let me just see here. All right. So thank you so much for joining this afternoon. My name is Angie. I'm one of the librarians for the Los Angeles Public Library, the Golden Hollywood branch. This program was originally intended to take place at the Golden Hollywood Library. It's part of a larger series of programs called Book to Action. For those not familiar with Book to Action, it's a framework. It takes a basic book concept and expands it to create a series of dynamic events. This year, 26 Book to Action series will take place at 55 libraries across California. The Hollywood Regional has chosen the book Urban Tumbleweed, Notes from a Tonka Diary by Harriet Mullen. Our partner this year is the Echo Park Film Center. We will continue to create programming revolving around the topics of writing, creativity, urbanism, walking, and observation. Please follow the Golden Hollywood Branch's Instagram and Facebook accounts to keep up with our online programs as they unveil. Before I introduce our speakers this afternoon, I just want to thank the California Center for the Book for supporting today's event. The California Center for the Book is a program of the California Library Association, supported in whole and in part by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and administered in California by the State Librarian. If you are streaming this from our YouTube channel, please fill out that survey at the bottom of the description. This will definitely help for funding for future Book to Action programs. We would definitely appreciate it. If you have any questions during the talk, please use the chat function and we will do our best to get your questions and comments answered. All right, so I would like to introduce to you Renee Reisman and Alyssa Walker. Renee Reisman is an interdisciplinary curator, artist, and writer at the crossroads of curation, social practice, and creative placemaking. Working within diverse communities, she studies the ways infrastructures are shaped by culture, urbanization, law, and technology. She is currently the creative catalyst and artist in residence situated within the Los Angeles Department of Transportation. Alyssa Walker connects people with where they live through writing, speaking, and walking. As the urbanism editor at Curbed, she authors the column Word on the Street, highlighting the pioneering transit, clever civic design, and game-changing policy affecting our cities. Alyssa lives in Los Angeles, where she is the co-host of the podcast, LA Podcast, a contributor to the CR KCRW show, Greater LA, and a mom to the city's two most enthusiastic public transit riders. So please welcome uh, Renee Reisman and Alyssa Walker. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Well, uh, Alyssa had this great idea to start off with reading some poems um, from either the book Urban Tumbleweed or the Instagram channel. So Alyssa, did you want to kick it off? Sure. I mean, I just felt like these were the most relevant they were already very relevant to what we wanted to talk about when this was supposed to be not an intimate chat in Renee's kitchen as I feel like I'm in right now but uh, <laughs> when it was supposed to be at the library um and even I just picked two that I thought were even more relevant right now just based on what we're all going through at this moment in time here's the first one walking along the green path with buds in my ears too engrossed in the morning news to listen to the stillness of the garden. I mean, that describes like every day of walking around LA. And then here's the other one, trying to like, drown, you're drowning out the, the beautiful nature around us with the, all the bad news from our earbuds. And then here's the other one. Pedestrians on neighborhood sidewalks, swerving slightly to avoid smearing a child's exuberant drawings in colored chalk. I'm seeing a lot more chalk, chalk work these days. And we actually just published a really great story on Curb today about chalk is back. <laughs> um, and I'll read a couple minor. So I'm going to read some that are from um, Harry. I was about to say Henriette, sorry. Harriet Mullen's book, Urban Tumbleweed, which is, uh, as Angie mentioned, this is kind of what all the uh, events in the series are based off of. So these were poems written while she was walking throughout the city. So I had one that's 
We proudly harvest rainwater assigned in a neighbor's yard with a deep barrel. I could humbly and thankfully harvest rain. And Arcadius crashed after winning the race. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, that was not the one I meant to read. Uh, I did not want that. Um, sorry, there it is. Craving the season of spring, we hunt for plump raspberries, baba beans, and pencil thin asparagus in the farmer's markets. Um, that one stood out to me because in Echo Park, where I live, our farmer's market is actually still open despite the strict stay at home orders that we have, which I think is actually a good way to like segue into this idea of like, what is it like to walk around the city right now? Um, walk or bike or jog or do anything that's not in your car, really. Right. <laughs> so, Alyssa, I just, what have been your immediate, just daily um, walking adventures since this has all changed? Well, yeah. And the other thing too, is we, when Andy and I first talked about trying to do this talk, we wanted to do it at the, right after the Hollywood Farmers Market at the Hollywood Library, which is right, you know, right there. And we thought that would be such a cool thing. People could come in with all their bags of produce and, and sit in the, in the library. So um, again, like we're just keeping that in mind, I guess, as we're um, all here together now. But I, I think for me, it's been very, it's been actually a really difficult time. <laughs> I mean, everybody's having a very difficult time. Um, but I think for me, it's been, it's been really heartbreaking to see everybody walking around. It's, it's, it's very, it's very wonderful to see people who are posting things on Instagram about new places they're discovering in their neighborhood or saying that there's things that they had never noticed before, or, you know, the Jasmine just started blooming on our street and it really has, it's, you can really smell it. It's very powerful as you walk around, but, um, it's also been just very, very difficult to, to see just because you know that that has come with such a cost to people's livelihood and um, jobs and lives. And, uh, and uh, we were, were talking earlier about um, what Jeff McFetridge's piece that it was in the New York Times last weekend, um, which had this very you know, poignant, I think, like closing to it, which was about like, I, I love seeing people out in my neighborhood walking with people I've never seen before, but I wish they weren't walking, walking because the world was ending. And in that way, <laughs> um, I've, I've been trying to really make peace with it. And I wonder if how, how you feel also if, say when you're going to the farmer's market in Echo Park and it's, it's so strange to see the, the tents like six feet apart and the lines of, of people trying to stay away from each other, like how, like what that does, what that does to us, kind of seeing our our familiar places and our familiar rituals so change. Yeah. So you know, for me, it's been very interesting because I actually had a more or less work from home routine before the pandemic. Um, I work like so many different jobs, <laughs> and so like some of them are remote and some of them are not. But um, so on a daily basis, walking my dog twice a day is like the majority of how I get outside. Um, and so of course I have to continue to do that while this is all happening. And so for me, it just feels like, oh, it's another, you know, dog walk, just like always. Um, but we're putting, I'm putting my mask on and like, we can't like I can't take her to the dog park and people can't like they're not really supposed to be petting dogs so I guess they could be a it was called like a fomite or something where like um we're learning so many terms we did not yeah I know <laughs> um so it's been interesting because I get to see yeah this like change and like who is walking around right now like when you are a dog walker, you start recognizing the same people over and over again, and the same dogs and the same joggers, even, even if you never speak to them because you're kind of on a routine because you're trying to do it, you know, like at the same time every day or whatever. And I feel like this mix of like, yes, I think I'm seeing so many new people on the streets because they're so stir crazy that they're like, okay, I'm gonna get out a walk, which we normally don't do. But then I also see the other people like trying to continue their routine just the way I am. 
And so it's like this strange paradox of like, everything is the same, but different. Um, and I'm trying to like, yeah, I'm like, do I believe that there's more people walking than ever before? Or do I not? Uh, because there's that too, where it's like, no, it's just the same people. But then I'm like, hmm. But one thing I have noticed more, more than the walking is biking. I am seeing so many more people bike. And this is a city where it can be really scary to get on your bike and, and go down Sunset Boulevard or another like really big street. And yet I'm seeing the bike lanes like a lot more full than usual because I think people are like, I can't go to the gym and I wanna do something more vigorous and just a walk. And so they're like on their bikes for the first time in who knows how long and there's so much less traffic. So maybe they feel less scared. <laughs> it's that, that's been wild, I think, to see. I think too, I mean, there's people who are, you know, we're seeing all of our transportation um, choices or not even choices, we're seeing them, we're seeing kind of essential transportation really being challenged here. And um, I know people who um, have to take the bus or the train to get to work, you know, who still have to use these modes to get to work. And biking actually does reveal a, a kind of a better way to get around if you are worried about um, the fomite surfaces, as you said, um, or being in close quarters with people, um, which is really shining a light on, you know, the, the power of certain modes of transportation. At the same time, we had a choice as a city a very long time ago to actually make that safe enough so it didn't take a pandemic for somebody to get their bike out of the garage um, to take to work or to protect the people that were already biking to work or to riding a scooter or any other non-car mode um, and you can see in other cities how easy it was for people to kind of shift from one mode to another maybe to, if they didn't want to take the bus or the train they could very easily take protected bike lanes and we still haven't provided that for our city and um, it would be a shame I think if we if we started to you know as, as cars will return to the road, which I think they inevitably will. I already feel like more cars are on the road. I feel like more people are going places and, and driving places. Um, it would be a shame not to try to look at how we, we have failed um, certain parts of our community and, and certain populations and not say, how can, we, how can we fix this to make it a better world for you? Yeah. Yeah, it is like, um, as like working at LA DOT, I have been told that traffic fell at, at, mo at most like 80%. And I think it is now starting to pick up again, even though our safer at home isn't over yet. It's like, we're so, I think people are so stir crazy and they're like praying that it doesn't get extended again. And they're, oh. and then like this heat wave has been a really interesting time too, to, be stuck at home because I, I mean in LA a lot of people don't have air conditioning or anything and so or like all the pools are closed <laughs> yeah I mean think about it like all the places that you go well first of all a lot of people have work or school to go to to escape their apartments so I think for me when I first when I first moved here I lived in Hollywood and I was always like I don't really need air conditioning I don't need it doesn't matter to me because I can always go somewhere else one of those places was the library the Hollywood library <laughs> one of those places was like the mall the Hollywood and Highland Mall I don't know uh, the grocery store Target whatever and now all those places are gone so what what is that going to mean over these warm few weeks you know yes you could go to a park but the journey to get there will mean walking down a street with no trees and you will be very people who have to go to these essential jobs um, are, are waiting at bus stops that have no bus shelters, no shade. So um, it's really going to push the limit of what we're able to you know, deal with on top of everything else as it starts to get warmer. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have air conditioning and I was like, Maybe I'll get some work done on the roof of my building because I have roof access, but it's not like a fancy building that has a roof all built out. It's like literally you can just stand up there and it's satellite dishes and nothing and there's no shelters, no shade. And I was like, ah, oh, this doesn't really work during the daytime because it's just direct sunlight on my face. Um, but I did see though, because you, in your latest articles and just ways of walking around the city, um, you know, maybe other ways to escape the heat wave are just like urban hike, urban hikes or like 
using the 311 app to report things while you're doing that urban hike. Um, I know that like the Museum of New Neon Art recently released like neighborhood guides so looking at neon signs in your oh, nice. neighborhood. Um, so could you talk a little bit more about like the ways to do these like urban adventures yeah. <laughs> or just because you're bored <laughs> right I, mean, I I immediately like I said it's it's almost a good distraction to have something else to do and I have two small kids who are always very distracting so that usually helps to be able to um they're always looking for ladybugs or butterflies or they're always finding things on the ground that some things sometimes are questionable to pick up but um that the other thing I've been trying to really do I've always been like a 311 um you know, a really big fan of using three one of champion because I just feel like it makes your walks more like a video game. So um, as you're going around, you can be like, oh, there's an end table that was abandoned. Oh, there's palm fronds blocking that sidewalk. And you could just start, you know, seeing how fast it, it takes to, for the city to come pick it up. And it's, it's really exciting to me. And I probably log like dozen or so um, three one requests a week. And it also really gives you a, a chance to improve the blocks around your own neighborhood, which is what I'm really trying to do is stay in my own neighborhood and take very short walks um, during this time just to make sure that you're keeping, you know, the public health officials are like, stay in your neighborhood so you don't spread the virus beyond, you know, where you already live and, and expose other people. Um, and then I think another thing that's been really fun um, is to get those plant identification apps. There's also one for birdsong. I haven't gotten as into that, but I've been trying to make sure I know what every single flower or tree or shrub that I come across as so my goal is to try to know um, as many as possible <laughs> by the time this is over. What's some of the new species of plants you've learned about? <laughs> you know? there was, there's this gorgeous tree that I had seen a few times, but you know how sometimes like a jacaranda is a perfect example. You don't know it's a jacaranda the rest of the time. And then you're like, oh, that's a, then you see when it's blooming. You're like, oh, now I remember there's a jacaranda there. And this was a tree that I had walked by a bunch, but then it had like these very delicate kind of like purplish, not, not jacaranda purple, but like pale purple flowers. And it's called a china berry tree. And it's just exquisite and it smells good. And it's like, it's such a gorgeous little shade tree um, that's, you know, on our street and had never, had never really taken the time to see it before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it was like, I had a friend of mine that was much more well-versed in plants or something. And like, I remember once like on my block, they were like, oh, you have jasmine like all over your neighborhood. And then like it had dawned on me, I was like, wait, do I know what a jasmine plant looks <laughs> like, smells like? Like now, and so now when I walk around the street, I'm like, that's what jasmine is. Like, Yeah, they need like a smell app too, where yeah. you can, like, it tells you what it smells like. Yeah. yeah, and I think also right now it's loquat season. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of loquats um, hanging over sidewalks that you should probably wait till you get home and unmask to um, enjoy those. But uh, you can probably pick some and no one will be too upset that you grab yeah. their low class. I think there's also the, because I know not everybody is adhering to it, but hopefully people are walking around with the masks and the PPE to, to stay protected. But I feel like the way that you breathe through the mask and how that, like it really has changed my walking experience, I think. <laughs> And I mean, are, are you and your kids walking around in the mask and like, how has that been making you feel about like being out on the streets? The kids are, the kids have them. And um, if we go into a place with other people, they have to wear them, but um, we mostly just don't take them anywhere. Cause I feel mm -hmm. like just walking around the neighborhood, um, if we stay clear of other people, children are just going to be pulling on their mask the entire time and saying it's hot or uncomfortable. So they don't have to. Um, for me, I alternate between uh, masks. I'm from Matruska, a very local uh, a dressmaker who made, she made my wedding dress. So she's now made my mask for the uh, COVID-19 outbreak. It's very exciting. Um, and uh, she made a bunch of masks for us with all these cool patterns. So we have like zebras and sharks and cats um, to wear. But for me, I also sometimes wear just a bandana uh, that has a little bit more, it still has two layers of fabric, but it has like a, um, I don't know, you can breathe a little bit better. I feel like if you're, you know, our guidance to the county, I don't think you have to wear it when you're just walking around um, as long as you steer clear of other people. So 
I think with exercise, it's probably pretty tough if you are breathing yeah. heavy, you know, take I'm, what precautions you can. But I, yeah, I, I think you, if you are maybe running in the middle of an empty street, as we can do right now, it's probably okay to. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm okay. seeing like the, I see the masked joggers and then the unmasked joggers. And um, I'm, I'm not like, I've never really been a runner, but yeah, I actually did a little bit of jogging since this started too. And I was like, I can't really do this with a mask. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> like, maybe I haven't trained my lungs yet. <laughs> well, again, I mean, this points to the public space issue, which I did write about this, you know, last month, just about this is just showing if you have, well, if you have like a Peloton or a treadmill, you're definitely fine in your house. Um, but if you, you know, have a, a swimming pool, you could go swimming. Um, if you have a block that has super wide sidewalks and you felt comfortable and you, there are a lot of places that are near parks that are open, um, people have a lot of space to move around. But like we, you know, where we, where you and I live, I know we live, we live in parts that are, the trails are closed and they really don't want people near places like um, the Echo Park Lake, as you try to, if you try to run around there, you're just dodging people the entire time. So um, in San Francisco, they opened up their public golf courses and let people just walk <laughs> to the golf courses. And I was like, when is that happening here? When we yeah. can just give, grant all this green space back to the people. <laughs> I know I, I just read about the golf courses actually and I was kind of like oh that wouldn't be too bad if we did something like that I don't know many urban golf courses in LA but I mean there are some I know there's, there's not yeah the, there's public ones and private ones I'm not sure we would have as much luck getting to the private ones but I guess we could work <laughs> on it for the next pandemic yeah um but that also like yeah I I live so close to Echo Park Lake that that's constantly where I'm walking and I don't want to like have my mask on, but there are, I'm just like, there's people everywhere. And I saw so many um, like socially distanced picnics going on over oh, yeah. the weekend. <laughs> and that has been an interesting thing to see is like who is deciding to still go out and do their like picnics. And then if they are doing it, who's masking up and who's not. Um, and I heard that the beaches this weekend were like very, very crowded again, even though I think they're supposed to be close to the public, like people are just going anyways. That's um, just, actually, in Orange County, they were not closed. And I think oh, in LA County, not. LA County would have, didn't have any problems, but I think if you could go, there was like a line like between Orange County and Ventura County with pictures, you could see like there was like tons of people on either side uh, and no one on the LA County side. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, man. It's just so interesting to see the ways that, um, like, people are imagining that once the orders are lifted, and it looks like it, it looks like they will start be lifting maybe in phases. But do you think there's just going to be this like insane like surge of people doing all the things that they've been missing the last two to three months? I think it's it's going to be really hard, and there's been some interesting um, ideas um, put forth. I mean, one is like. Yes, the beaches are actually kind of a great place to open up because they are so big. I mean, same with like somewhere like golf courses, you know, it's just like they're very, they're, they have many access points and they're very large, but they're probably only in areas where already maybe wealthy people live or people who are slightly more wealthy. Um, so I don't know how, yeah, if you decide to open up certain places first, it will start to, the inequities will start to, you know, surface again. But one thing I saw that was pretty interesting was like you would use your last number of your address as an odd or even. And it would be like, today is the going out day for the even addresses. And tomorrow is the going out day for the odd. And they wouldn't have to like regulate it or anything like that. But just so you knew that only half the city <laughs> would be trying to go to the same park maybe as the same day as you. I mean, I, I don't know how, yeah, I don't know how you suddenly like flip a switch and everybody goes back to how it was before. I mean, hopefully the city can, can look at how to take so many of these extra wide streets and not just, you know, try to carve out space for walking and biking, but also carve out spaces for outdoor cafes. I mean, we know that the in, indoor dining is going to be probably one of the last things to open, but what if you could take tables and chairs and really spread them out like into the sidewalk, into the street, into parking lots, you know, create these like very big open air 
um, dining experiences, which LA kind of sucks at in general. Like we just, for our weather and how, you know, <laughs> how we orient ourselves as a culture, we just, we just don't have a lot of, you know, it's, 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 we have great, like, you know, taco stands and all these other, you know, informal ways of dining. But I feel like the restaurants permitting is actually really hard to be able to put seats outside. There's all these different rules. So let's change all those rules and get ready to have a lot more of this, I don't know, like an outdoor cafe, picnic table, uh, parks, streets into parks kind of culture. And that will help us get us through the summer, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's proving that like, yeah, uh, you know, our, we have <laughs> we have too many roads in LA or like they're just in some places like you just go into a neighborhood and they're just so wide. It's like they've been made for tanks to go down them or something. Um, it's, you know, I, I grew up in hardcore suburbia in Chicago and I'm so used to like these insanely large streets that, yeah, really could be such active outdoor space and, and extending the parklets and the, the sidewalks are kind of small and narrow, so there's not really a lot of dining space or for you to walk around it. And so it'd be so great just to see like at least one lane or something like pushed in for, for more outdoor space and more. Yeah, I like that idea so much. <laughs> it's yeah, just sidewalk widening. We already should have done it before. Again, yeah. like it's just something we, we could have done and this could give us a chance to, to do it. Yeah. Um, I see like a, a question came in on this sort of related to this topic is like, how do we advocate for open streets in LA? Um, you know, I know a part a uh, problem with Vision Zero and the Department of Transportation is like, you know, advocating for things that maybe would be a lane reduction or to, to lessen parking lots or some, or, you know, kind of give those streets back to the people. But there are a lot of people that might not support that or the politicians are more likely to listen to the drivers than the pedestrian and what are yeah what are some of the ways that we as like citizens and pedestrians and cyclists and whatever might try to get the open streets um, infrastructurally implemented there is a group in uh, the delray neighbor in delray neighborhood the delray neighborhood council has done um some outreach and created a proposal for what you know, they're really just calling it, like, I think, slow streets where they're just, it would have just be like a kind of like a construction barricade. So you could drive around it if you lived on that street, obviously, or like if somebody need to get by, but it's kind of like a local traffic, no through traffic type of um, closure of soft closure, I think they call it. Um, but so, you know, just picking some streets like that and just saying, this is what we're going to do. And I believe that you know, they're working with um, Mike Bonin's office, who is the city council member for that district, and they've already talked to LADOT, who, you know, is, is reviewing their idea. And then I heard of another group in West LA that's also doing the same thing. It would be a shame if it only happened in neighborhoods on the West Side. Where they, yeah. You know, I, I, I would think that this would be hopefully be something that could be um, be tested in, in other places too, which again, especially in the neighborhoods that you know, I live in a neighborhood that I live in historic Filipino town and um, we're, we have, there's this map by the uh, Trust for Public Land and it uh, shows like how, how park core your different parts of the city are. And there's like red and yellow and green for different parts of LA. And LA actually has, I think it's only 60% of the people who live in LA have a park within like a 15, 10 or 15 minute walk of their house. So, um, you can look at this map and really see where the open space, existing open space options are, you know, very, very limited. And, you know, for us to go to a park, it's, we have options. They're all like 20 or so minutes away. Some are not the easiest place to go with two small children who don't have a lot of tolerance for walking. Um, so maybe the, the thing to do from the city's perspective is to start by looking at those like red zones where um, people aren't, even when the parks do reopen or, you know, more recreation reopens, um, how to make sure that those neighborhoods are served first by this. And I think that's, that will bolster your argument um, as an advocate and, and try to show that what, what you're doing is actually happening in the right place. Because I think often what we think when we are advocates, and I'm grouping myself into that, is that um, what, you, what you think matters is the only thing that matters. And you're not talking to, say, the person who's lived on the block for 80 years or you know, someone who was there before you, before you might have moved there, and making sure that what, 
what you want is maybe not uh, canceling out something that they have been fighting for for a long time, which I think happens a lot mm -hmm. in these conversations. Do, do you know where someone could find that map that you just talked about with the, the red trust house? for public land? Yeah, if you go to the trust for public land, it's something like a park score or some park score maybe, but trust for public land is they're an amazing resource mm -hmm. for things like this. I think that there is also a uh, like maybe a knowledge gap between um, you know you mentioned like why you know hopefully only the west side or not only the west side will get these resources but I think there are some communities that might have a little bit more of a education on how to like do public like how to talk to the representatives and how to get those people on their side and what are like ways people can learn a little bit more about like just the process, just to even get their voices heard. Um, me too. Yeah, no, it's it's really it's really hard, especially if you don't know. Like I said, like um, the work has been done here for for decades. You know, you it, what you find out so often. Like I was always like, you know, why isn't Hollywood Boulevard closed to you know cars and it should be a pedestrian only zone? And then like you learn like in the seventies they tried to do it. You know, it's and and then the reason that they they couldn't succeed is because people used to like congregate there and spray silly string. And it, that's why they, they have those silly string um, signs that are up there during Halloween. You know what I'm talking about? It's one of my favorite, it's one of the most yeah. amazing stories. But anyway, someday I will write like maybe- In the municipal code. Right? Yeah, in the muni <laughs> municipal code. If anyone shoots off silly string, you'll be like jailed for years or something like that. But I think like there's, so, there's just so many interesting um, stories about this, you know, public space being contested and, and, um, and how people have tried to try different things and they haven't worked out. But um, there's two really great advocacy groups that I suggest um, following for kind of a lot of these things. And one is um, Los Angeles Walks. I was a board member there for um, a brief time a couple of years ago, maybe like 10 years ago. Um, and that is a really like a pedestrian advocacy group that has a really strong focus on equity and making sure that everybody has access to um, a safe and uh, accessible walking experience. And then investing in place is another really great, great, great advocacy group because they're really about um, advocating for those physical improvements. So things like bus shelters and, um, you know, really good infrastructure for uh, for walking that is tied into these investments that um, cities are making. You know, we have, we had a lot of money coming into these types of um, improvements through things like Measure M and we had our gas tax money um, from the state. Uh, I don't know how the, that funding holds up when we don't have people paying for gas or buying things to contribute to our sales tax for Measure M. But um, but I think these these types of changes will be more important than ever to advocate for because what will happen first is, and what we've already seen happening with the budget, um, the, the mayor's office you know, releases their budget saying we're not going to have as much money coming in because of this pandemic. And the first things to go are things like sidewalk repairs and tree planting. You know, we just started this really massive new tree program in the city where they're doing a census and that work's all continuing, but it's it's going to be, they're going to have to take cuts in, in certain parts of the program. It's always these little things that contribute to, you know, just being able to walk to the bus stop, you know, <laughs> like we, we still, we need that to be protected maybe better, better than anything. Yeah. I'm hoping that like through my residency that we can do what I have pitched as like a mobile town hall mm -hmm. kind of things mm -hmm. where we're gonna, well, I, it's not set in stone yet. So I don't want to advertise something that's not going to happen. But my idea is like, like, can we get our politicians like, onto the bus and like have our question and answers oh. right while people are in transit and maybe some of the people who normally can't show up at a city hall meeting, they are suddenly like, in front of a person that they've never got to talk to before. I mean, and I think as a great um, show f from our politicians that transit is safe to use when it is <laughs> when we are out of the safer at home order, and um, and when we are ready to get back on transit, I think it'd be amazing for all of our elected officials and metro board members to be taking transit to work and all of their daily activities for an entire week and just tell us what it is like to be back on the trains and buses and bikes of this city. I want to issue that challenge. <laughs> 
what might be ways to, um, I know, like, I guess I'm kind of circling back to something we already talked about, like how biking might feel safer than taking public transit, but, you know, ridership is down and it's, um, but it's still like, you can't, it, you know, this is not a numbers game, right? You have to go to work because you're an essential worker. Like, it doesn't matter if the bus is one person on it, like that's life or death right there. And what are ways people can maybe feel safer about riding transit right now? Like whether it's personal health or being around people or what are, yeah. Just. I think, well, so now what we've had here and I think, I think DOT, LA DOT is the same thing where Metro dropped to like a Sunday schedule, right? Because it's just the demand is low and they wanna provide like the, like you said, the basic service for people who absolutely need to take it, um, who don't have any other options or who just rely upon it. And, but they can't really afford at this moment to do any more robust service. But um, at the same time, you do have like, the streets pretty empty. And you, I just look every once in a while on my, on my app, you know, I, I just dream fantasize mm -hmm. of the day when I'll be able to take transit again. But I was just looking and <laughs> you know, all the buses are running on time. Like we're getting to see this like really wonderful moment of what it might be to have dedicated bus lanes on every street because it's actually working the way that it's supposed to work. And I think um, if you look at other some other cities that have really um, kind of reimagined, that, like San Francisco completely took apart their bus system and rebuilt it over a weekend to serve, the, you know, the corridors that needed to have better service to make sure the areas that um, were prioritized that that weren't getting type of service. I mean, they they are going to have to kind of change that and add in uh, you know other service. They also close some streets for for walking and biking too. So I think almost what I would love to see, you know, we've got our next gen bus plan, this metro's big um, idea to kind of reinvent the bus and make sure it's serving everybody better. And this idea that every more people will be within a, a few minutes or more, it's like a majority of the people I can't remember the numbers right now but um that more people will be within walking distance of a high quality bus stop so almost everybody in the region will be able to walk you know 15 minutes or less and get to a bus and a bus will come within like 10 minutes or less so you start to have this predictability around so I think what we should do is as we start to build our service back in you know just don't ever lose that reliability and that predictability and figure out oh okay well now how more cars are coming on the road. We're going to make sure that there's a dedicated bus lane here, and and all that outreach work. We start to play. There will be some shade structures that pop up into the summer months and, and keep it cool for everyone, um, and maybe some other su surprise um, infrastructural changes that will that will happen. I think that will get, make people understand that the city is really deciding that it's going to take care of people who are going to be riding the bus. Yeah. And like something I learned as like working for the department of, for LA DOT is that even though the traffic has been lower, the fatalities rate has stayed actually pretty constant, which suggests less of a amount of people on the road problem and more of a issue with like speeding oh um, gosh, yeah. empty everyone wants to go faster i've and, seen uh, it yeah i mean i've experienced it a few times where i've been like that person is going 80 miles an hour that person is going 80 miles an hour yeah. yeah and what do you think are ways that we can advocate for people to drive like drive safer or just yeah like how do we get people on the road to also <laughs> My face, I'm like, uh. I think again, this is a place that if we had had the infrastructure in, see people speeding like that, you know, we, if we have things like visual cues, like where we have, you know, pedestrian crossing where they've kind of shortened the crosswalk or bulbouts, whatever you want to call them. Um, if we had like more trees that were in the street, you know, creating like this kind of but I think what happens are, are some of our boulevards are just so like they're there's blank walls and and blank uh, shoulders and and there are not many people around and people just kind of like buzz by it but if you have you know if you have some some variance in the landscape I do think it helps people to especially if there's businesses and, and people out walking you know if you don't have any of that stuff right now it just makes people seem like they can drive really quickly by it but infrastructure can help a little bit I think the one thing that that would be 
really cool to see would be, you know, if we could, if we could make sure that when people are turning to um, the streets and, and people are still out walking, some of the changes like with the with beg, eliminating beg buttons, um, which is something LADFT has done, we, they've taken, they've turned off all the little buttons you have to press to cross the street as a pedestrian. Mm -hmm. So one thing as we come back, like, let's never turn those back on. <laughs> like, just to know that you can go across the street and the light will change for you. And especially if you're somebody who, you know, I have a stroller, you might use the wheelchair, you might be I'm getting, you know, on that those few little feet from you to the button and then you miss the whole light cycle and you have to wait. It's so frustrating. Mm -hmm. So let's keep those off forever. Um, the timing also of some of the signals I've never turned off the green wave thing. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, my connection has been a little bit spotty and so I don't know if I've frozen or you have. <laughs> okay, so it is Alyssa who, who froze. Um, okay, you can hear me. Can you hear Alyssa too or just me right now? Just me. Okay, cool. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll work on Alyssa's connection in a moment. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I wasn't, I, I missed some of what she, oh, Alyssa, are you back? Yeah, yeah what happened? Did I go? Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. So we yeah, lost it for a moment. Like, <laughs> uh, I don't know where you lost me, but I know I was getting really excited. Bag buttons, is that what we were talking about? <laughs> yeah, so I had you, I, at least for me, I'm not sure about all the audience, but I had you kind of like break up right when you were talking about the buttons and the green wave. Um, and yes. can you explain what green wave is and, oh, and no. what you're about it's to say about again. that? It's happening again. Oh, no. All right, can you hear me now? I don't know what's going on. Okay, it must be my connection. Okay, um, I was hearing that I was frozen, but I'm back now. Okay, so you gave me a thumbs up. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So let's not turn the beg buttons back on. Let's keep them off and let's make sure that um, like you don't have to worry about crossing the street uh, or pressing a button. And then uh, the way that we've so is we've turned off the the green wave. So when you when you're driving, when you see a green light, usually if you're going the right speed, you can cruise through a bunch of green lights at the same time. Um, and this way, the way their lights are programmed now, or this like mode where it kind of stops you a little bit more. So Let's work on things that prioritize people walking or people who need to cross the street or people crossing the street and make sure that we keep those changes going forward too. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, the other, the other thing I heard was that there's more drag racing happening, <laughs> like people on the road just doing that with their friends. And uh, I advise everybody, please don't do that at all. <laughs> Very, even when there's like normal conditions it's very dangerous yeah um i think something people also notice a lot too when you're and this kind of goes on with like missing that light is that um you know our sidewalks are actually also not in the best of conditions and so if you are disabled or if you um are juggling a lot of things or you walking your kids walking your dog pushing a cart uh it it can sometimes be really challenging just to get from point a to point b and there's a lot of things that can hinder you so i think another thing that is really important not just with like extending the walk times is just giving like drivers just need to be a bit more patient and like let like just kind of wait it out and let people move at their own pace um i think a really interesting part about corona is that um we've lost a bit of our, our sense of urgency, which might actually be a really good thing. <laughs> and I think moving slower and realizing that not everything has to be an instantaneous, like, you know, I feel like that's that's very Americanized or it's a very big cultural thing that everything has to be done at like this in, incredibly quick sp uh, pace and that we don't have time to relax. And um, do you think you've, you've been noticing that response to urgency as well on the streets? I mean, that's a good, the, the best thing that w would come out of this is that everybody who 
has the privilege of being home people who are able to get out for those walks and who, who they didn't have time to do something like that before are becoming advocates or at least are, are realizing some of the problems you're talking about and are passionate about trying to fix them, especially for people who don't have the privilege of staying home. I mean, I think for a lot of people, this, this time is consists of trying to go and find food every day, whether you're going to like a lady, um, free meal pickup or you're going to sit in line in your car at all, like, you know, a non-stressful day. And I, I know a lot of people who are, are, are spending all their days doing like mutual aid, um, out driving things to people um, who need them, who can't leave for whatever reason, who can't go out for a walk. So, I mean, we have to really think about you know, what this moment is and how different it is depending on what your zip code is and what your, what your health background is. And um, I think the, the biggest thing we, like you said, I, I, what we could hope for is that um, people would understand that they have the moment right now to change something that's been pretty ingrained in our city and um, that if you have had the time to enjoy this moment that you also might dedicate your time to try to fix those problems. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen a lot of questions coming into the chat. And so I wanted to invite on, ask some questions. Yeah, I wanted to invite <laughs> to ask some questions while, um, before we you know, wrap up this conversation here. But um, Yeah, I, I also saw that you had suggested like mapping the quarantine routes. And I wanted to know more about like, uh, what you mean by mapping your routes and charting that. Yeah, this was something such a cool project by City Lab by a friend of mine, Laura Bliss, who's this uh, great writer at City Lab on a lot of these issues that we're talking about. Um, and they just had people draw maps of their quarantine life, which means you're probably living most of your life in a very <laughs> condensed, like seven block mm -hmm. radius or something. And it's just so wonderful, not just people kind of uh, drawing maps of what places are closed or inaccessible at the moment, but also um, like little tiny landmarks at the end of your block that you might not have noticed before or certain people's yards have become, you know, really fun to look at for like my kids, like my daughter the other day went and did some like chalk drawings for some of the neighbors who are just, more people are outside just kind of doing yard work or just hanging out and she, you know, you're able to talk to people from the, the sidewalk. So I love the idea of, of having my kids and, and what sticks out most of them, you know, and maybe they can look back at it in a few years and be like, oh, um, I don't know how they're going to remember this time. I'm not sure I want them to. <laughs> I think they're, I'm lucky they're young enough. They won't really remember too much of it, but. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I know. It's like, this is going to be the next, like, back in my day story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All of us are going to be saying, like, repeatedly, oh, my God, like, it's going to be great in a Seriously. weird way. <laughs> uh, it looks like um, someone on, on from the YouTube stream. So I'm excited that there's even more people watching this. Hi, multiple streams. Hi, YouTube, shout out. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know much about this question, so I can't answer it, but uh, it seems like they're spending extra time working on the new metro stations. Is there any news or knowledge on that? Yes. And the fact that there have been fewer cars on Wilshire to accelerate the build out of the purple line which there will be a subway going underground so for an area like that what they usually have to do is they dig a tunnel obviously with the underground like a tunnel boring machine and then um what they have to do is a lot of stuff called decking on the top of the street so that does affect uh the you know surface traffic even if it's down below and then a lot of stuff that's happening with just regular construction, which continues um, because a lot of times the closures around like big buildings require, you know, street closures as well to like, you know, do cement pours or all these other type things that, that they have to do. So um, there, I think a lot of things are getting from that perspective too, just because they're able to deal with, you know, less cars. 
Uh, I see another question too about like the clean air streak. <laughs> and which is over uh, actually. <laughs> yeah, I, I read that that too, that actually our clean air is maybe no longer, but it was the cleanest since 95 was what it I was read. Good, yeah, yeah, it was a good, it was a good effort. So how do we, but how do we like at least learn from this and keep the air clean or, or at least try? <laughs> I mean, this is another really, uh, so to clarify just what we were talking about, um, the heat, it's our air isn't always just to be blamed on the pollution of, you know, created from cars and other industrial sources. Um, the weather actually does have a lot to do with it. So when it got super hot the other day, it's just, you're just going to have a lot of like trapped pollutants, particularly ones that are very close to the ground that kind of make the air feel kind of thick and gross. Um, so that's why if you, I use my like uh, air quality tracking app every day. I check it like the weather. So I was really sad to see that we were getting into the yellow and the little bit of red. It was it was really disheartening after all those uh, days. But it's true. This was the longest streak we've had. And and what's been happening every summer is that our air quality has been getting worse, not just because of more cars on the road, but also because we're seeing a lot of more extreme heat events. So um, I think again, this would be a, an amazing time for the state to step in. And I know we've got a lot of other issues, but the state offers things like, you know, you can trade in your old polluting car and you could trade it in for, um, you, you, can get, you, can, you can just get cash. I mean, you could just get money back for it. Um, you could trade it in for like an e-bike under certain programs. You could trade it in and get like a, you know, a, some money off of the, if you wanted to buy an electric car. But if you, if we offered those things, maybe people would want to do that. Maybe because they've been finding other ways to get around right now and they might be excited to keep trying that. Um, they might want money if they are not, if they really, really want to get some extra cash in their pocket. But also if we could guarantee as a state that we really were going to bring back transit in a very, um, you know, vibrant way and make sure that everybody would have better access um, for those people who are able to have options. I think the, the biggest problem is, is that we built our society around having, you must have a car to participate. And um, the state hasn't done very much to change that, unfortunately, um, including paying for the widening of freeways. And you know what were they doing in Burbank this past weekend? They were just continuing to widen this giant freeway that's just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, and so the state would have to kind of do that hand in hand. But if we could say, if you want to try to get around without a car, we're going to help you even more, especially if you lost your job and you need to be looking for jobs or you need to be looking for employment that's accessible. Um, the state needs to support that. And that, that could be a big part of whatever climate policy we have going forward. Yeah. Yeah. I think it really shows that, you know, some people argue like have we hit that point of no return <laughs> with like car with emissions and pollution and climate. And I think it shows that we still have a chance of dialing it back in that yes, maybe there is a, a some aspects where it will just never be the same. But I mean, if we can get back to 30 years ago, you know, in, in two months with such drastic measures, like maybe there is, you know, maybe obviously we don't want to be safe staying at home forever. But like there are, I think, things that we've had to do during quarantine that maybe should be like implemented throughout. Oh, just like today, how we got uh, the, they decided that everyone in LA County can vote by mail. We've been asking for that for a really long time. Oh, all you had to do is just decide that we had to do it because of the pandemic. Great. Like that's going to make it really easy for more people to vote. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think there's been an impression that like some jobs just no matter what can't be remote or that there's some ways of commuting that are the only option. And I think we're kind of realizing like, we can adjust and we can do things differently. And I will be a little bit saddened if society just goes back to the way it, it always was before this. Um, so hopefully we will start adapting. Uh, for people who are walking around and they're actually kind of getting bored of the routes that they always do, uh, Alejandra on YouTube wants to know, how do you, how can she safely explore further? 
no pressure. That was, yeah, that was the, the thing I was trying to, when that uh, story we did for Curbed uh, at the end of the week last week was not to encourage people to go seeking out new adventures right now as we're not really supposed to be doing that. But two great resources that I have in there, which I use all the time are um, Eric Brightwell, who's an amazing um, walker and writer and he does these hand-drawn maps. He's mapped, like, I think, well over a hundred neighborhoods um, and with just little cultural landmarks and little interesting bits of history and you can go and follow his maps online. Um, the other thing I really like to look at is Survey LA, which is the historic cultural something resources page, but you just go to Sur Survey LA and you can find it. And it shows like all the um, landmark structures or historic buildings or architecturally significant buildings. And I love to go just seek out, I found like a house the other day in our neighborhood that was built in 1883. I didn't even know there was one that old that was um, nearby. Um, and then there's a, a great architectural uh, the Architectural Guide Book to Los Angeles or something like that. I can't remember the exact name, sorry. Um, but it's a really great uh, book that was just recently updated. So it has, you'll, you'll be able to find something in your neighborhood through one of those resources. And I love the neon idea. I think that's a really, that's a really fun one you were talking about too. Yeah, yeah, those guides. Um, I think they're, they have them to Burbank, but I think it's like all, all around the city too. It's not just in that, uh, the Valley area. And yeah, I think, um, like I live so close to Angelino Heights and I'm like, I should go and walk around those Victorians. Oh yeah, that's a great one. Like I've driven past them, but have I ever actually taken the time to like walk on foot for a few hours and just like really take them in? Um, we've had a few, so one person's asking, um, Colin is wondering, What's our response to some groups that are pointing out that density might be the problem for generating more traffic traffic and they're pointing to the current pandemic as further proof. Oh, uh, I think uh, you're, yeah, there was an op ed in the LA Times. Oh, um, okay. Last weekend by Joel Kotkin, who's like a very um, uh, a suburbanist, I guess you would call him, instead of an urbanist, <laughs> so, um, who is often advocating for, um, you know, the, the suburban life that uh, some people do prefer, for sure, and uh, is also the setting in which I grew up. You said that you grew up in the suburbs as well, um, and was saying, using the response to the pandemic, um, as a way to argue that cities are the problem, um, not just for the transmission of disease, but I guess just for a, a way of living that um, mm. is, is going to be preferable going forward. Like a, this will scare people out of cities and kind of using the example of New York being the epicenter of, the, um, of what's happening is like this density argument. I would just say, I would offer this up. My parents live in a very small town in Colorado um, my mom got COVID-19. Um, they have a lot of friends who <laughs> have the disease. Um, they have a much higher uh, death rate and much higher case rate per uh, 100,000 people than other dense cities. <laughs> it's a very rural uh, community. I really think there's much, you, you can make all sorts of different arguments that you uh, can to bolster maybe any argument that you want uh, with I what I see it at when I when I see comments like that um, to me it's it's much more about it's it's kind of ignoring the what the bigger problem is is that the people who are dying overall from this disease are predominantly black communities or people they just did a study here in LA looking at the data it's poor communities are dying at much higher rates so it's if you want to make it about uh, suburban density versus uh, urban versus whatever kind of density, um, you're kind of erasing a big part of the conversation, which is actually about equity. And um, you can choose to make it about that, or you can try to make it about people wanting to live in, you know, a certain type of housing in a certain type of place. Well, I mean, too, uh, on equity, I mean, like if you live in a rural area, your healthcare options are more limited too. And so if you do get sick, maybe it's harder to recover. So it's maybe not so much about 
how much yard space you have, but more about like, how do people interact face to face and what are their options if they do get sick or if they do even need education on how to interact in this world. So That's right. yeah, there's no ICU beds in my parents' county. So if you got sick, yeah. you have to be flown outside of it, which means you have a greater chance of dying. Yeah. But yeah, I actually think what you said was right about yards. Like chances are if you do have a yard, a large house and a yard is you're probably going to be uh, someone who is wealthier and your health outcomes will be better in that situation. So in that, in that case, it might be about uh, if you want to make it about that, but I don't think a lot of people are, are able to choose that option if they would like to live in that place. Yeah. <laughs> I know one, uh, someone named Chloe wanted to know a little bit more about the book Urban Tumbleweed and um, you know, so I, I have a copy with me and this was um, the author, Harriet Mullen. What I believe what she did was she called it a Tonka diary. So a Tonka is a Japanese poem. It, ha uh, it has 31 syllables. And so it's in, in it's similar to how we understand a haikus, which I believe are like five, seven, five, where the Tonka is, what was it? It was five seven five seven seven so it has yeah. like two additional lines to the haiku and so you can either write it in uh five lines or what harriet actually did was she did three lines so you can kind of see really close um so they still kind of look like haikus are just a bit longer and i believe what she did was that she took a walk every single day and wrote at least one tonka um daily so there's 366 in this book i think so slightly more than one for every day of the year, unless maybe it was a leap year, who knows? <laughs> um, but yeah, and it's great because she walked around LA uh, most week, so it's very LA specific, but it's fun. One thing that I found fun too is that you could tell she took at least one or two trips during the year and kept writing. So I think one takes place in Ohio or something like that, and one's in Florida, <laughs> and they kind of like jump out at you because you're like, that's not LA, like what? where did she go? How did she get there? Um, and I think this is like, it's just a really cool way to diary or journal. And so maybe too, as a way when you're walking around, it's like maybe you write your own haiku or your own tonka uh, based on what you see and what you observe in the world. And so I know Alyssa wrote one that was posted to Instagram. Um, I have one that I'm, I'm gonna write and work on. <laughs> I have not given it to the library yet, but um, just by walking every single day, you Bye. can just see these little bite-sized poems. And even if they don't need to flow beautifully, you can just, as a way of recording, like what do you see and what's different and what, um, it is kind of like noticing the plants and the birds that you never saw before <laughs> or that you needed an app to identify. Um, I think one thing I noticed while walking around the lake, I think I did start thinking about this before the lockdown, but then I really started paying attention was that I noticed that the species of ducks at the lake have changed in the last year or two <laughs> uh, at Echo Park Lake. We used to have Muscovy ducks, which are a breed from Mexico and they're gone now. And now they've been uh, replaced with the Egyptian goose, which is I think from Egypt originally. Um, and I don't know, I. I I don't know why they did that. <laughs> I don't know what happened to the old ducks, the Muscovies, but uh, I think, I hope they ended up on some kind of like duck refuge or something. But it made me start thinking about like the politics and the aesthetics of uh, urban waterfowl. <laughs> and it's like, were they getting feedback? Cause the Muscovies have these like weird wrinkly faces and these weird beaks. <laughs> They kind of look a little gross, to be honest. They look really strange. And the Egyptians are very sleek and they have these nice little red eyes and these brown feathers and these, they're just way more regal and elegant. And I remember like, I think it was New York City got a, a, a Mandarin duck and everyone called it the sexy duck. <laughs> and I was like, did Echo Park have its own version of like duck controversy? Like That better be your poem. Can you please just make that be your poem? <laughs> Uh, the sad not as pretty ducks they don't know but um that's like as a as a freelance writer myself I'm like that's kind of I was like I need to do an investigative 
piece on this. Yes, I would love to read that. I definitely, yeah, I definitely noticed different birds and maybe just more, you know, the whole nature's healing joke. But like, um, there's definitely like pelicans flew over our house, which they just, you don't really see those very much, or, you know, I don't know. But um, yeah, I love that idea of, I, I'm, I'm kicking myself for not writing, deciding to write a poem every day like this, like this tongue because it is really about this meditation of going through your neighborhood and um, things that we're doing. And I wrote about kind of what happens in our neighborhood um, every night, which is um, we have somebody playing the trumpet, which I didn't really connect to that it was my neighbor until I posted it on Instagram. And then they told me, which I thought was such a funny, <laughs> uh, I didn't know which house it was coming out of for sure. Um, and then the way that uh, I didn't include this in the story, but uh, it almost always sets off just one firecracker, which I think is like mm -hmm. the most LA thing. <laughs> Somebody on my, right outside my window, um, they were setting off uh, like 4th of July level firework. Like they set off just one and it was like, I don't know. It was close enough to me that I could see it from my window. And I was like, what is going on? And then like I waited and I waited and, and like they didn't do a second one. <laughs> but it was blue and yellow. And then I saw like on Twitter, other people had heard it, but not seen it. And and then it ended up on next door and being like, what was that loud boom? And it's like, I know the answer to this one. It was, I saw it. <laughs> next door. Next yeah. door is like nice now. Everybody's pretty nice and not. Oh, nice. mine's like in a war right now. Somebody <laughs> read. Oh, it's already over. Like the nice part of next door is already over. No, yeah. Mine was mine. Somebody wrote a, a, a post complaining about people being passive aggressive on next door, which is um, the most next door thing you could do is passive aggressively talk about. Passive there are, I guess there are a lot of like mask and sidewalk wars still. Going yeah. On and so yeah. My, my, my little neighborhood has been in a, a battle recently. Um, <laughs> Colin asks us, what are our top three books related to urban living and planning? Our top oh, okay. oh, I wish I had, I could pull out some books in front of me. Um, oh. uh, urban like I mean can you I don't know LA specific or, maybe or I know is about libraries so books. <laughs> um <laughs> we actually did a great we we did an amazing um thing at curb we did 101 books about uh, where and how we live so um I'm sure I picked a bunch of different books in there uh, a bunch of us collaborated on it and you you can go check it out um, really like a, a, from, there's a lot of LA books in there. There's all different, um, types of resources for like urban planning, there's transportation. Um, one that I, I think one that I recommended in there, which is just something that I look at a lot is the Richard Scare book. Mm -hmm. Things that go. Um, and it's just really been interesting to, this is not the urbanist book that you <laughs> thought I was going to cite, but it's been really interesting um, understanding like how I learned about how cities and neighborhoods were supposed to work and um, seeing that through the lens of my own children. And they books have even been updated a lot. So there's like where it was like very like gendered representations of um like a mailman they've now like they're like a ponytail and they're like a you know it's like a little bit um our cultural times right now and our our, our our social like structures have changed so i love um like rediscovering how i, I learned about cities in the first place and and how what my children are picking up on um and there's just such great detail and and learning so much about um I don't know, even like the vehicles themselves really get me excited. <laughs> what about you? Do you have any you want to recommend? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, so a few years ago, I read a book by Jill Stoner called Toward a Minor Architecture. And I think it was written in response to like the recession um, and like all these buildings going like emptying and homes foreclosing and just like, or what, other people consider urban blight or like that kind of thing and it was kind of I have such bad memories so it's hard for me to like recap it without like probably making up half of what it was about but it I think it you know it thought about like what would be considered minor architecture which is like 
architecture that is built and occupy like how we occupy space by people who are disempowered or how people who were most affected by like the loss of their home or their building like had to reclaim space and architecture and um just thinking about like what does the world look like when we have to adapt to changing power dynamics and changing class and income and, and the way that our space changes during these times. So I think that book might become really relevant now, again, in the time of coronavirus, because we're going to have a lot of places, unfortunately, that aren't going to open up again after this is over. And it's really sad to think about. But maybe there can be some ways of reclaiming those spaces or uh, creative ways of adapting and reuse, reusing them or ways that artists can take over these spaces. So. Um, that's yeah, a, I, a, a book. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I don't There's know. a book that I'm really interested in that's coming out. It's not out yet, but you made me think about um, something that's really, I'm really excited to read in this new context, which is Angie Schmidt, who is a really great writer on um, pedestrian safety and, uh, you know, the our death crisis when it comes to motor vehicles in this um, country and how SUVs have contributed to that. And she has a book coming out and, it, you know, she's finished it and then it was the pandemic. So we have this book that was kind of written in the before times that will come out in the after times. And it's such an interesting, it's going to be such an interesting book to read now when you know, we've lost like 50,000 lives to this pandemic in, in our country, which is now more than we lose in a year um, to motor vehicle crashes. So it, I think it will be just the framework of how, again, like how we go back to um, trying to rebuild our lives and hopefully not going back to what it used to be, but like you said, going to something better. Um, how do we look at how we all work together to save many more lives that could have been lost through this um, and kind of apply that to getting around our cities every day. Yeah. Um, and I think like though, I think it still holds up pretty well. I always just think about uh, life and death of great American cities. It's a great like kind of like intro to urban planning um, uh, by Jane Jacobs. So that's, that's another one of my top three, I guess. <laughs> relevant for this conversation for sure yeah <laughs> yeah um i don't recall how long is this <laughs> we'll be here for four hours if anyone needs to ask us any more questions uh yeah i was wondering if the audience had any more questions for us and um yeah, I, I think, you know, Alyssa, did you have any more thoughts that you wanted to share about walking or wandering or? Yeah, I think we should all, I think this has given me a lot of good, um, uh, like I said, I, it's not only that I have um, gone outside with much trepidation <laughs> for the last few weeks, just because I'm, I um, am scared. I mean, like I said, my, my mom got this and I've been, I've been very worried about getting it. Um, and I, I don't know how we go back to our lives that were about um, being social and, and being um, neighborly and being connected um, without that kind of fear. But at the same time, um, we're, we seem to be connecting in ways that we weren't before. And I'm hearing all these really wonderful stories about um, people meeting people who live a couple of houses down or connecting through different like you know google spreadsheets like it's like people have these <laughs> make these spreadsheets try to help people or or um try to get you know supplies to someone or something like that and there's been so much great um just conversation online and and um stories and and photos being shared so i really hope that um I really hope that we go into this better connected as a city. When I wrote this story very at the very beginning of all this, kind of talking about how disasters intent, you know, end up bringing people together. And a lot of people have talked about after the last earthquake here, not the most recent one, the, <laughs> the, um, the Northridge earthquake about how it really changed a lot of people's relationships to their neighbors and to their city. And um, I, we have so much 
healing to do and we have so much work to do um, and, and we have so much um, as a city to kind of repair the, the bigger systemic problems that are like I talked about before that are really going to continue to plague us unless we decide to do something about it and I have a little bit more hope now and um, a lot of that is coming from walking around and just seeing these very brief little interactions from people um, that are just starting to pop up again in our neighborhood so keep up the good work everyone. <laughs> yeah. And I'm um, I'm going to be working on a project for the city and um, that hopefully I can announce in a few days, but um, but I'm trying to collect stories from people who are essential workers or people who are still taking public transit or finding new ways to get to work. Um, I'm, I would love to talk to you and I'm going to put my email, I think, in the chat just in case you want to reach out to me. Um, but I, I'm trying to collect these stories and I think I might have to uh, actually get on the bus and start walking up to people with my mask on but <laughs> and, and ask them, you know where, where are they going how are they getting around and um I want to know yeah how are people's lives changing from this and then is there anything you're going to take away from this experience or you know might this change the way that you commute to work or commute wherever for the rest of your life or, or are you just like I'm ready to get back in my car, <laughs> let it be over. And I can empathize with both angles, you know? I mean, there's definitely some changes that have been weird. And I love doing work from coffee shops and stuff. And I've been missing that a lot. So like, I'm going to go back to doing that. But yeah. I always walk to Hopefully that. Hopefully it'll be a nice open air cafe. Yeah, that, have all these beautiful um, beer gardens and coffee gardens. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, as the world slowly reopens, it's going to be so, I feel like everyone's feeling a lot more like maybe we've been taking our public spaces for granted. <laughs> and I think people are going to start really like, yeah, just really support everything that, that maybe, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go to so many places I probably never stepped foot in before <laughs> just to be like, hi, who are you? I don't buy you. And then you close and then I was sad. Um, but I, I think um, Angie's going to come back in now and start wrapping us up. Uh, I wanted to thank everybody for coming. Yeah, thank you both so much. Oh my gosh, thanks Renee. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, I hope to have you um, back in the library when we reopen. So let's plan on <laughs> doing that. Um, and thanks for everyone that uh, joined us. And definitely, if you're interested in writing a Tonka, please do so and um, submit it to the Hollywood Library. We'd love to share it on our Instagram account. And then also, before we close out, what's like the best way for folks to keep in touch with you guys, like follow your Instagram or? Uh, I'm a walker in LA everywhere. So um, Twitter or uh, Instagram, both work. Yeah, I go by Renee Reisman on in Instagram and Twitter. So just at Renee Reisman. And then um, for email, Renee.Reisman at LACD.org is a good way to reach me. Um, okay, perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much. And um, please take care of yourself. So that was, that was wonderful. So have a good rest of your night. Thank you so much for having us, everyone. Bye.